There, we'll go ahead and get started. I wanted to lift up our missionary of the week this week on the back of your church handout. Andy and Mimi Bonikowski are in my uh, absolute top missionaries. I know I say that every week, but we've known Andy and Mimi's for so long. Our, we joined this church in 1988, and we began supporting uh, Andy and Mimi's work in the Basque region of Spain in 1990. I even read on here they were married in June of 85. We were married in April 85. So it just seems like the same sort of phase in life and you're going through. These people are just doing a wonderful work in Spain. I get their emails and their newsletters and their videos. Uh, he's very good at uh, uh, media and I know that's not a replacement for the work of the Holy Spirit or faithfulness, but it's a good tool and he's very, very good at it. Uh, they have been sent out of the Berean Baptist Church in Georgia through Worldwide New Testament Baptist Missions. We've supported them, and you have if you're involved in Faith Promise Missions for 32 years. Uh, these are old friends, and they're good people, and you'll be glad that you had a part in their work when it comes to that day. Well, look in uh, Acts chapter 6 today. We're in a series called Introducing People of the Bible. We're actually in Lesson 18. I think there's 52 lessons, so uh, buckle your pew belt. We haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> today we're on uh, a wonderful man, Stephen, the first martyr. When you think of Acts 6, you immediately think of deacons. You think of the ministry they needed for waiting on tables and serving people and helping widows. And the people that were to divide the word of God were, to be, were, were not able to do both. And they said, we need to appoint ourselves some good and godly men, uh, spirit-filled men, full of wisdom and discretion. And it showed how even the smallest amount of work for the Lord needs to be done in the Lord's way. Out of that group of deacons that were introduced to in Acts 6 and 7, two of them jump out, uh, Philip and Stephen. Philip was the first missionary. Uh, Stephen was the first martyr. Uh, Stephen became the first great martyr of the church, and we've lived in such a pleasant time until very recently that this seems like ancient history, but it's happening again today that there's an army of faithful Christians, think especially of our African work that's going on, that uh, give their life and sprinkle the blood of the martyrs on the word of God. And this is this is uh, a, a, just a tremendous chapter in in biblical history, in human history after that, Nero had Christians sewn into blood-soaked sacks and thrown into the ring with, with the lions that devoured them. He dipped Christians in creosote and oil and lit them to light his parties. He was an absolutely demonic, diabolical, wicked man. And these were just the normal uh, functions of the early Christian church, martyrs, and Stephen led the way. Not only Stephen, the first martyr, but Philip, the first great missionary, he took very seriously uh, the Great Commission. He took very seriously the words of Jesus in Acts 1.8. And none of the apostles, you remember, wanted to go to Samaria. James and John were glad to call down fire from heaven onto Samaria. So Deacon Philip was the first one that went to Samaria. And he opened that door and quickly revival broke out. And before you knew it, Christians were out of the salt shaker and they were actually carrying out the Great Commission. And these men broke the ice and went the way. And these are not apostles. These aren't great flaming mighty pastors. They were deacons, which shows that even helpers and those who were sent out to do that were expected to preach and to reach and to, and to teach and to go into all the world. And Stephen was one of these good men. First thing I want you to see about Stephen, you're probably already thinking about Acts 7, the dramatic death that he had after the fiery sermon that he preached. Number one is that Stephen was a faithful minister. And it's good that he was. The church was expanding rapidly. Thousands were saved. The apostles were extremely busy, both in things that we would consider spiritual and that we would consider practical. Extraordinary things were happening. That they turned the world upside down, not just by the words that they spoke, but by the lives that they led. And these, these lives were changed and they were unanswerable. A great outpouring of love and Christians in a society that was more brutal than our society today were openly and extravagantly loving each other. When you see somebody that is openly and extravagantly loving somebody, you want to take whatever they are selling. You want a sip of whatever they're drinking. It is very, very attractive. As someone who wasn't raised in a Christian home, I thank God that he 
brought me into contact with Christians back in the 1980s because I would have followed anybody that showed love and that showed caring in a brutal world that we live in. There's this great outpouring of love in the churches was not going to go unanswered. You know, in our life, uh, in this world, no good deed goes unpunished. And if you do a good deed back in those days, the devil was very aware of it, and he uh, poked a few people to start raising a hue and a cry. The widows, God blessed them, started crying and, and shouting that they were not getting their fair amount. And they may not have been. I'm just saying this is what was going on. You know those ads on TV for the Medicare Advantage plan and Jimmy J.J. Walker's there and Joe Namath's there and every one of those women, and I don't blame them. They say, I want to make sure I'm getting what I deserve. Well, that's what this was going on in the book of Acts. The widow said, we're not getting our fair share of help. And that goes on till today. You talk to pastors, they're too polite to bring it up, but if you can get them in private, people bring them the most ridiculous problems about the color of the choir robes or the texture of the carpet or the arrangement of the chairs, all good deck chairs to rearrange on the Titanic while this world is going to hell in a handbasket. We're not, we're not trying to direct people away from that hell. Uh, we're fussing. Silly matters. Think of your pastor. Think of uh, everybody's pastor. They have only a certain amount of energy, and to waste that energy on fussing fleshly, carnal things is wrong and will be answered for. Peter, a practical man, had had enough. He said, I'm going to delegate the secular and the social side of the ministry to other men. It is not right that you should not divide the word of God. Not just anybody, though. You can't just hire somebody to do the parts of the work that don't seem as glamorous or uh, can be done by hands. Uh, it could quickly turn into a real mess, and so they put qualifications for these new helpers, these deacons in the local church, that were higher than most denominations would put for pastors. They were very particular and needed men with the highest spiritual qualifications. You said, well, they're going to be handling money. Do they need an MBA? Do they need a PhD? Do they need a degree in banking or 30 years experience with the Federal Reserve? No. They were much more stringent than that. They were heart qualifications and reality matters. Look in Acts chapter 6 verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. No mention of a finance degree from UT. Nothing wrong with a finance degree from UT. God can use people that are extremely and narrowly educated, but he has to work a little bit harder to break them out of the rails. That's the problem. Uh, not just anybody. So manward, Acts 3 says they had to be men of honest report. You need somebody working for your church that has a good reputation in that community. Number two, not only manward, men of honest report, Godward, men of full of the Holy Spirit. And number three, selfward, men full of wisdom, handing, handling knowledge skillfully for the glory of God. Uh, Dr. John Phillips, who wrote these outlines for us, said, number one, these deacons had to be men of sterling character. Their integrity had to be beyond question, people who could be trusted, people with unstained outward community uh, relations and reputations. Not only did they need to be honest, everybody needed to know that they were the honest people and that that's who the church was uh, putting these duties on. Men of sterling character, number two, these new uh, people, deacons, were to be men of spiritual capacity. The church was on fire, and therefore the church was under attack. They had to be able to handle uh, God's word and deal with the people of God. And for the most menial of tasks, they would need to be full of the Holy Spirit to have that wisdom extent in them. Number three, not only sterling character and spiritual capacity, they also had to be simply competent. Some people are just uh, not full of common sense. Some people full of common sense are not particularly spiritual. It's wonderful to find these wedded together, a spiritual man, a spiritual person, and someone who is uh, competent and that makes sensible decisions. Somebody said spiritually and common, uh, spirituality and common sense are often strangers to one another. Well, our point is that Stephen was immediately listed as one of them that must have popped into the mind of everybody, and he was uh, found to be a, a honest, capable, and spirit-filled. He was a changed man. He was a twice-born man in a once-born world. He 
was a uh, Second Corinthians 5.17 man, a new creation in Christ. He had a new life, and everybody knew it. He was Christ-like in his walk. He was Christ-like in his talk. He's a perfect person to represent local churches. We have people like that in our church. I won't embarrass you, but if they're involved in it, we all just nod and we lean back. We say, yeah, if Billy Bob's involved of it, go with it. He's, a, he's pure gold. He's 16 ounces to the pound. He's the right person. Uh, and, and we say that. He was honest, capable, spirit-filled, a changed man, Christ-like, and he experiences and demonstrates the continuous and ongoing uh, reality referred to in Ephesians 5.18 that he was uh, kept on being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the idea. Here's what the Holy Spirit says about a deacon. You know this in 1 Timothy 3.13. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Jesus Christ. In other words, the office of a deacon is a position for the development of spirituality and character and talent and witness. And Stephen met these criteria and he walked in this reality. He made, the Bible says, a full proof of his ministry. Again, this is not Spurgeon and this is not Moody and this isn't George Whitfield and just the flaming and thundering heroes of the faith. This is foot soldiers on target, on track, lined up, full of faith and power, and Acts 6-8 says, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Well, that's what he was supposed to do in this transitional time. They don't list the miracles because the main thing is that Stephen, in that day and in that time, manifested the power of God in his life. Uh, he, he made an impact for God for his generations, and he did so, according to Acts 6, by mainly working around the church and waiting tables and doing whatever needed to be doing. He ministered, Dr. Phillips says, in ever-widening circles to the physical and spiritual needs of his people. And Stephen was not just famous for his works. He was also famous uh, for an effective witness, an effective preacher of the gospel. Look in Acts chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Then there, and this is really good. I mean, listen to this if you don't listen to anything else. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Now stop here and think where we are. Acts 6 is before Acts 8, 9, and 10, so just remember that. Cilicia points to Asia Minor. The capital city is Tarsus. Does that ring a bell? Who would the enemies of the early church send to obliterate some country bumpkin in a debate but Saul of Tarsus? That was their nuclear warhead who knew the Bible inside and out. Saul was a trained rabbi. He had a mind like a steel trap. He was a disciple of Gamaliel. He was a formidable opponent in debate, to put it mildly. Dedicated Jew, a soaked in the Talmud, bigoted Pharisee, and absolutely convinced that Jesus Christ was an apostate and the Christian church was a cult. Do you see in this corner Stephen, who's been working down at the uh, lunch area and, and cleaning the tables and arranging the chairs and walking with Christ. And on the other side, a man with uh, the equivalency of a triple PhD. We would have heard of Saul if he had not been the great apostle Paul. He was that brilliant. Perhaps Saul had a sharper mind, but the Bible records he was no match for Stephen. Absolutely no match. He was not, the Bible says, able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Uh, I love biographies. You read the life of Moody. There was a very uh, aggressive atheist movement in Chicago in the days of Moody. He said, I want to address them. 5,000 hardened agnostics and atheists and D.L. Moody uh, went in and absolutely melted them. Hundreds came to Christ. He knew why they were rebelling against God about the wickedness in their heart. He was able to do that by not only the wisdom that he spoke, but the spirit by which he spake. You can't overcome somebody who, despite what you say, you can tell they still love you, and what you're saying really doesn't matter that much to them. They just diff diffuse and disarm you. 
Stephen had the word of God on his side. Saul said, Saul, he said, there cannot be two Christ in the Old Testament. There must be two comings. Look at his life, Saul. Was this a blasphemer? This was the Son of God. He walked on the waves. He stilled the storms. He turned the water to wine. He fed hungry multitudes, healed the sick, cleansed leopards, casting out evil spirits, raising the dead. Deny his life if you can. His death. He died the just for the unjust. God commendeth his love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us to bring us to God. He fulfilled the law of the prophet, uh, the law and the prophets. He worked out perfect human righteousness, which he would impute to your account if you came and trusted in him. He fulfilled Isaiah 53. He fulfilled Psalm 22. He fulfilled Psalm 69. And after his life and after his death, he rose from the dead. Where's his body, Saul? Where is it? Uh, 500 people saw him. You are a trained Pharisee. Let's review the laws of evidence and probability and say, is it possible to have a mass delusion where 500 people said the same thing and still do it today, even as they're being led to their death? This wasn't done in a corner, Saul. Stephen obliterated Saul in a debate, and his IQ was half that of Saul's because Saul's is smarter than anybody that we'll ever know. What an answer. Faithful minister. Number three, not only faithful minister, fearless messenger. You know what? The, uh, the political world has been all fired up this week. Well, it was the same in those days. If you can't persuade them, persecute them. You know, you, if you can't, uh, that's like I remember Dr. Rogers said that uh, uh, cursing, he said, you know, someone that gets on the show and just uh, pours out some filth. Cursing is the attempt of a feeble mind to express itself forcefully. You can't think of anything to say. You can't match what the other guy or girl said. So you just go, blah. And you think that is a sign of wisdom and maturity. That's not. It's a sign of ignorance and infamy. That's what it is. Uh, I, I think about that all the time. When somebody starts down that road, they're out of ideas, they're running out of steam, and you've got them on the ropes. That's the idea. Uh, if you can't persuade them, persecute them. And before long, the arguments were lost, and the Jewish leaders decided to put Stephen on trial. They accused him of attacking the scripture and the sanctuary, just like they did Jesus Christ. His spoken defense in Acts 7, you've read it before, it is a masterpiece. I took a course in public speaking in college, and we read all these things, John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King and Cicero, and there have been some great speakers, and thank goodness God's given some wonderful speakers into our uh, churches, but they're nothing uh, compared to Stephen. Uh, up there with Peter at Pentecost, uh, Paul at Antioch, Paul at Mars Hill. Throughout the ages, who have we had? We've had Jonathan Edwards. You had to read, and I did too. Sinners in the hand of an angry God. People holding on to the post of the church house because they thought the floor was giving way into flame and fury beneath them. Spurgeon, who I always thought was the greatest preacher in the church of the English language, but he said no. He said, uh, short of my master, I follow Whitfield with stumbling feet. Other men but lived. This man was wing, fire, force, and flame. So he said Whitfield was the greatest preacher, and I'm sure Whitfield had somebody else. We're not in some rankings. We're just rejoicing that we have some people that uh, could move the masses with their words, and Stephen biblically is in the forefront of them all. We can't read the whole message in Acts 7, but I can break it down for you. This was masterful. Uh, Stephen, first off, his defense, his apologia, his reasoned defense of a principled position uh, revolved around three points. Number one, saviors. Here's what Stephen said to an angry mob. God has given Israel saviors like Joseph and Moses, but you wicked Israel have rejected them. False witnesses were accusing Stephen of speaking against Moses, and Israel's whole history was to reject, if not kill, the prophets that God sent. Number one, saviors. Don't throw that in my face, Israel. You're a lot worse than, than anything that you accuse me of, even though it's false. Number two, not only saviors, but scriptures. God had given Israel the scriptures, and God had given Israel the law, but they had broken the law, and now the a nation was sliding swiftly into the grossest idolatries, and now 
the Jewish leaders were dishonoring the law by attaching all manner of human tradition and made up things to God's perfect law, you are the ones, Stephen said. And I mean, he is, he's not blinking. They're backing up. You are the ones who did greatly dishonor the word of God, not me, not Christ, you. And remember, Stephen had the advantage that he was full of the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost was extremely active in this early church, clearing things up. And those people's hearts were absolutely pierced. They responded not in repentance, but in fury and anger. But we're not there yet. Number one, saviors, your problem, Israel, not mine. Number two, scriptures, your problem, Israel, not mine. Number three, sanctuaries, where to worship. It's like, just like in John 4, that woman wants to argue about where we're going to worship. God first gave a tabernacle and then a temple. The temple was David ideas, but not God, but God accepted it. Solomon built that temple. And now you small-minded people think you could contain the God of heaven in a building made with stone and bricks. You cannot. Absolutely category error. You're not thinking clearly. In Stephen's day, the temple was counted an holy place, but like every holy place in an unholy world, it's quickly uh, defiled. Did his accusers repent? No, they didn't repent. They'd lose their position in the political energy. They would lose everything. They were furious. They got mad. Guess what? Stephen was not through speaking. Let me read you this word for word. Amid a growing uproar of dissent and fury, he hammered home his conclusion. They had accused him of defiling and reviling the holy place. He accused them of resisting and opposing the Holy Ghost. They accused him of sliding Moses, the man of God. He accused them of slaying Jesus, the son of God. Uh, they accused him of blaspheming the law. He accused them of breaking every law, both internally and externally. Bold Stephen. You know what Stephen did? This is just a regular guy. This is like Peter with his... He had no training at all. They just perceived he'd been with Jesus. Stephen took the charges and leveled against him, picked them up, hurled them back in the face of his accusers. You know, absolutely goes back at him and didn't back down a bit. Look in Acts 7, uh, verse 54. When they heard these things, they repented in their hearts and came to the Christ that Stephen preached. No. You're reading the wrong version here. Let me try again for you. 754. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. They gnashed on him with their teeth. Have you dealt with somebody, maybe a telemarketer or somebody that won't stand on their warranty, and they, you try to talk to them, and they just get furious? They're just like a furious blood just dripping out of the corner of their mouth. They're so angry. It was fuel to the flames. They turned into animals, into a pack of wolves, faces hideously disfigured and distorted with fury and with rage. Uh, it was fuel to the flames, and that was the end of Stephen, we thought. So, and now the next point. Well, this is the shortest lesson. I hope you all have some games to play. It is. <laughs> I'm thinking, gosh, I wish there were more lessons, but sometimes they don't talk as long on these lessons. He was also not only the first and fearless messenger, he was the first martyr. Having hammered home the truth of God's word, he looked around at the ring of faces around him. He's not dumb. He knows he's probably about to die. And guess what? Forget the probably. He was about to die. He looked up instead of around, and Acts 7.55 says this, But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked steadfastly not at them but into heaven, saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. He didn't look around. He looked up. Uh, two short years before, Jesus Christ had returned to heaven. He'd been away in a rescue mission for 33 years. We've heard Dr. Phillips uh, preach at our old church on Psalm 24. Lift up your head, O ye gates. Lift up the everlasting doors. The King of glory shall come in. Jesus had gone home in majesty and triumph and glory. He had come from glory to visit a distant planet in a remote galaxy that we would call the Milky Way. He had returned home triumphant in a battle-scarred human body 
and he had assumed once more the glory that he had with the Father before the world was. Glorify me with the glory I had with thee before the world was. And he did. Can you picture his welcome? If you could, if you can buy tapes of Dr. John Phillips, he loved to preach on Psalm 24. The gates of glory swing wide, the trumpets blast, the angels sing uh, the hallelujah chorus over and over until the music of it rings through the everlasting hills. All heaven rings with the praise of these shining ones. It's kind of a Revelation 4 and 5 moment. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And then earlier in Revelation, uh, uh, four and twenty elders casting crowns. And again, he takes his seat at the right hand of the majesty on high. This is the first time Stephen's seen Jesus. You know, he wasn't there at the Mount of Transfiguration or anything. And this, with these people around him, I think their faces started to fade as God prepared him for his translation into heaven through the portal of death. Uh, seated at the right hand of the Father, the one that he saw, seated means completed. (laughs) Uh, When someone speaks up here and they're through, they go sit down somewhere. I mean, they're through. And the work has been done. Completed by God the Son was the work of salvation. Co-equal, co-eternal, co-existent with the Father. God over all, God blessed forevermore. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 13, it describes the position of Jesus now. It says, from henceforth, expecting till all his enemies be made his footstool. All he's going to do is a mop-up operation that's going to be executed by one word, drop dead. This week, uh, John MacArthur is on the glorious return of Christ. I I like to listen to him. He's 22 minutes of his daily program, and they have just a very focused program. That's exactly what he's talking about is Revelation 19 and, and the verses in there. Drop dead, and then they're just going to be a footstool. That The day that Stephen was tried, admiring angels still stood around the crucified form of Jesus, gazing on his face and looking with reverence and with awe at the marks of Calvary. Um, those marks are the only human thing in heaven. Uh, I like the Chronicles of Narnia. I've read that book many times. I love it when Aslan gets w- woken up and he lets out that roar and all the children ride on his back and he's alive again and they just stare at him. And they just and also his enemies stare at him just before he obliterates them. Looking with reverence and awe at the marks of Calvary, that's what Stephen was doing along with the angels, along with God's side of eternity. Uh, their eyes riveted on him. But guess what? Stephen wasn't looking at the people. He was looking at Jesus. Jesus was was not looking at the angels. He was looking at Stephen. Him. Exactly. Uh, Stephen on earth alone. Uh, You know, that's one of the great advantages of having a big God. Uh, You talk to people all the time. They say, well, my God does this. I go, where is he? Out in the garage? Did you make him with Legos? Or what do you mean, my God? There's only one God. Uh, You're being ridiculous. Uh, the real God with whom we have to do is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. That means he has all the time in the world to deal with every problem that you ever have and every issue in your life. And, and even the best of people that I love, I can tell, you know, flicker the eyes or something, that they've got to go. They've got to go. They don't have all day to sit here and hear me whine. God has all day to sit here and listen to me whine, and then he's going to make it right. And Stephen alone, surrounded by a wolf pack of craved, crazed scribes and Sadducees and Pharisees and priests and rulers and rabbis, their faces distorted with rage and lips curled back like a wolf from gnashing teeth. It's all over in a minute. You know, C.S. Lewis said about death, one wrench and the tooth is out. It hurts. We're in a bad situation. But all of a sudden... Relief. I had that big surgery two years ago, and I, I thought, well, this is going to be. And then, I, then I thought, as they were wheeling, wheeling me back in there, I thought, you know, I don't have to do anything in this situation. Most of the time, I have to do something with my job or my home or my family. And you know, once they push that little like they're telling you a silly joke, you go, ha ha, <laughs> you're gone. It's like the TV set goes off, and then all of a sudden you wake up and you go, Shazam, I'm alive, and I'm okay, and you're so glad. 
uh, faces distorted. Jesus recognized the scene that Stephen was going through. Stephen was aware that Jesus recognized the scheme and the scene that he was going through. It was very familiar to Jesus. His end of his earthly life was surrounded by a raging, furious, beard-ripping, spittle-spitting animals. And then it was over. He just dismissed the whole thing. Stephen wasn't able to do that. But Stephen alone, one man alone, bravely telling a howling mob. We haven't gotten there. We're getting close to the howling mob now. Uh, the, the truth is it is in Jesus. I mean, we've had it so nice, and I enjoyed it. I mean, I enjoyed the last 30-something years, uh, and I'm sure many of you a lot longer than that, but it's getting kind of bad now, but it's just going back to normal. This is just normal Christianity. You can see it in the life of Jesus. You can see it in the life of Stephen. Here's another quote. The slow fuse Stephen had lit now reached the powder keg. It exploded with fury and with violence. The mob seized him. They drug him through uh, the chambers into the bright sunshine, marched him uh, through the streets to a skull-shaped hill and saw the future apostle Saul, the one that he had debated against, said, I'll hold your coats, boys, and keep, keep those arms really good and free. We want lots of good velocity on these stones. Get a bigger stone. I'll help you. I'll do whatever I can. Stones began to fly. And as far as the nation, uh, prophetically, those stones hurled, sealed their destruction. This nation at this time completely turned away from the Messiah. Summoning the Romans, God through them would level the temple that they wanted to argue about, and in within a few decades, he would tear down every stone from the temple. Sad choice, choice of destruction. You know, when the rich young ewer walks away because he had a lot of money, and you've had people too, you've talked to it, and you can see they're just kind of pulling, and you know they go, I'd lose my dental insurance. They turn away. They say, I'd lose, that cost me money. They turn away. They'd say, my father-in-law would laugh at me. They turn away. That's the idea. Rejecting Christ, rejecting Messiah, rejecting the Holy Spirit, murdering a blood-bought, spirit-filled, spirit-anointed servant of the living God. We've had this abortion thing all week. I was so glad this week I delivered babies from 1985 to 1989. That was a long time ago. If you want to have a baby, go to somebody else. I wouldn't trust me right now. I guess I'd be if we were in Desert Island, I might help you, but I just don't think that that's... But I had uh, a lady come in, and uh, she was with somebody else, and she said, now, we've met. I said, oh, really? I'm always glad to see people have met. She said, yeah, 1986. I said, 1986. I was an intern then. She said, yeah, I know. I said, you deliver my baby. And she showed me the picture on her phone of this 36-year-old man with a uh, big, strong guy. And I thought, uh, well, I wonder uh, why we didn't abort him. I'm sure it hurt a lot. Just a blob of tissue. The blob of tissue. He was driving a Chevy Silverado and his biceps are about this big. He was a man. He's a person. That's the idea. Uh, choice of destruction. When I, when I see the angry faces, where was I going with that? I, was, I forgot my story. The angry faces they showed on each side of the arguments outside the Supreme Court and everything on the people that wanted abortion. And I thought, you know, they probably got a story. A lot of these people may have had gone through an abortion or something. And when I look at them, I'm, I'm not there yet, but I'm starting to see, I think, this is a hurt, angry, sinful, of course, person. And uh, that look in their eyes, uh, the anger part, the fury, makes me think about this story here, about the anger and the fury. That's the idea. And just like Stephen was careful to give them the truth as it is in Jesus Christ. We are too. They're not. Our, don't make enemies of sinful people. Don't be mad at sinners for sinning. Duh. <laughs> that's what they do. That's what you did most of your life, and that's what we do when we get in the flesh now. Uh, so that's no surprise. That's the idea. Look in uh, Acts 7, verse 59. It says, uh, And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Have you had people tell you that you can't pray in the name of Jesus or to Jesus? I don't know what their Bible does with this. It's a hard verse. Acts 7.59, uh, 
Stephen called upon God and said, Lord Jesus, first off, Lord Jesus there is identified with God, and second, he's praying to the Lord, a direct prayer. So, no, no, no big argument. I just had so a lot of people get really wound up about that. Uh, verse 60, he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Boy, I hope you're that way today. Uh, I think Dr. MacArthur calls it moralism. Moralism, outward morality, and fury at those fury at those who don't do what you want them to do is an enemy of the gospel. These are not your enemies. They are people that are going to die and go to hell without Christ. Is that enough punishment for you? Does that, does that get your bloodlust out of your system? Uh, I, I think you better do what Stephen did and what Christ did and try to tell them, but that's how you feel, buddy. You can just go to heaven, and I'll show you how. That's the idea. Because when you get in their face and start getting furious at sinners for being fur uh, sinful, you're, you're just spinning your wheels. You're absolutely of no use to the cause of Christ. This, this, this is the right attitude. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. That's what Jesus said. They know not what they do. That's the right way to approach people that are furiously opposing things that you hold dear. It's hard because we like to fight as well as anybody else. But we've got to lay that down because the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. That's the problem. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, you read John 11 tonight before you go anywhere, and you'll see what sleep he had. He slept uh, the sleep of death and was with the Lord immediately. That's the idea. It's strange how things turned out. Saul watched that. He loved it. He loved, Maybe he just for enjoyment would go to the Colosseum and watch them kill Christians. Ah, it's just the greatest fun, isn't it? Guess what? He was destined to die a martyr's death. That which he was enjoying and mocking and holding the coats and cheering the wrong side, that was all going to turn on him when God brought him to himself in the person of Jesus Christ. He would never have imagined that day that he was going to wear the martyr's crown. Something happened to Saul that day. And you know what the portal by which it reached Stephen and Saul that day? It was Stephen's face. It says it was like an angel. You may have little children you may have called angel face, but this is a man who is dying, but he still had a face like an angel. Or his message, which again, Paul thought, I can't believe this sermon he just preached. It just, he's exactly right. It destroys everything that we brought against them. We're wrong, but I will not admit it. No one will ever know. But it impacted him. He's kicking against those pricks. This is one of those right there. It, was it his face, his message, or his calm assurance, or his forgiveness? It's not normal to speak comforting words to somebody that's going to kill you. Uh, Saddam Insane was twisting around on a rope when he was hung. And they shouldn't do it because it was not the function of government. They were making fun of him and mocking him, and he was cursing and blaspheming back to them. And that's what we would expect of Saddam Hussein. Uh, but that's not what they saw in Jesus or in, or in Stephen. Saul, mark this, would never forget Stephen. I'll tell you as a somebody that God didn't save till I was 24 years old, things people said to me, uh, in the first two or three years of medical school, I remembered every word that they said. They didn't know it. I just went, <laughs> and I went home at 2 in the morning. I thought I remembered every word that they said. Now, you say you got a good memory. Not that good a memory. That's the Holy Spirit bringing that to mind and just saying, what about this? What about that? How does that feel? Not good. <laughs> he said, you know, give in. Or the, you're in your mind, and I'm not going to give up here. That's the idea. Acts 6, 15 says, All that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. And that angel face haunted Saul till it was replaced in his soul, finally, by the face of the Son of God. Uh, when the stoning of Stephen was over, devout men picked up what was left of his body, the broken body of that first martyr, and they washed it, and they wrapped it, and they gave it a decent funeral. And what to do now? Another leader is gone. Persecution was coming. You know, the people that loved the Lord Jesus saw the face of Stephen, and they were encouraged by it, and they were challenged by it. But suddenly he was dead, and they looked, and they saw another face, and they saw the face of Saul. Saul's face was full of blood, lust, and zeal, 
and fanaticism and determination. That man was like a military man. He was not going to stop until he had executed judgment on all these Christians. At the same time, fighting the conviction of the Holy Spirit, which would eventually get him. There was weeping over Stephen. He was so young and so full of promise. Why did God allow this to happen? And we don't know why, but it's all through the Bible. If only they could have seen Stephen then. If the veil was pulled back, receiving a martyr's crown, and angels surrounding him and carrying him up and welcoming him home and conducting him happy and triumphant to the Lord Jesus Christ, bowing at his feet, again, it's over. It's very quick. I, I told you, yep, i got time. I, I told you that story. There is a man, and I can't, honestly, I can't remember his name. I know we're not, I wouldn't talk about him anyway because that's not right. But uh, up here in our cemetery at Jefferson Memorial Gardens, I know exactly where his grave is because I go through there sometimes, and I know a whole bunch of them. I did not do anything to them, I promise, but there's just a bunch of people that died happily and are up there. He was 85 years old. He had renal failure. I made rounds at the old hospital behind Carson Newman. And uh, he looked okay, but I just had an impression I should talk to him. And I said, uh, Bob, I can't remember what his name was. I said, Bob, uh, do you, are you now, you know, you're going to, you may pull through this, but you're going to die pretty soon. So am I. Uh, what's going to happen? Where are you going to go? What's, what's the answer if they say, why should I let you in heaven? And he just started crying, which is always a good sign at that point. And he said, uh, He's 85 years old. This was probably 1990, so this is a long time ago. He said, when I was a little boy here in the something community here in Jefferson County, we had a, re a combined revival for two or three weeks, and they let school out. I thought, oh, what a nation we have changed. There was no doubt. There was nobody, no, he, he just said that like that was the most obvious thing in the world. He said, they let school out so we could all go. And he said, I went the first night, and... Uh, he said, I, I, I trusted Christ, and I, I was saved. And I, I was walking to the meeting the next night with my friend. They were both little boys. And he talked to his friend. He said, I'm going to think about that. And his friend got real sick and died. It's a very dramatic story. And I said, oh, I said, well, I am so glad that you're saved. And then they called me about noon and said, his blood pressure is dropping. I said, well, move him back to ICU. We'll start a drip and IVs and everything, do our best. Uh, but he's DNR. You know, don't, don't, don't do anything dramatic. And so I came over to see him. And he was. I mean, the, on the monitor, it said that his heart rate was, you know, 75, 64, 53, 42. And his blood pressure was 90 over 60, 80 over 40, 70 over 30. And he was kind of looking like this. And I, and I said, Bob, uh, today is the greatest day of your life. In about 90 seconds, you're going to be completely out of this old broken down body, and there's not going to be any kidneys to fail. <laughs> you're going to be with the Lord, and you're going to see Jesus Christ face to face. And he was just looking at me. His eyes never left me. And uh, about 90 seconds, he was gone. And I thought, now that was dramatic to me because I happened to be there. Most, most of my patients that passed away, I'm not there. But that really impacted me. And I thought, but that's true for everybody that dies in the Lord. Uh, one wrench... The tooth is out, and it's just glory. If I was a better speaker, I'd shout, but my shout sounds kind of squeaky. So glory, <laughs> that's wonderful. Uh, here's the end. The, there he is, what the Bible calls the spirit of a just man made perfect, entering into heaven, into the joy of the Lord. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And then personally, well done, Stephen. Well done. Welcome home. Have a seat. Let me show you what I've got planned for this young man, Saul, down there. That's the idea. Well, these lessons are, are good. We've got lots more of them. Dr. Phillips, I, he wrote lots of good books and preached lots of good message up there at Moody Bible Institute. But I don't think any of them I like better or are better received when I talk to people about it than these uh, individual stories. It just cuts across the grain of the scripture a little bit differently than the chronologic grain. It just it shows us a lot of things. Lord, thank you for today, and thank you for Stephen, and th give us a, a little bit of his boldness and a lot of his wisdom, and all these heroes, help them, uh, help them uh, be presented before us that we can apply their truths and their principles to our life, and we know they did it by looking at you and following you and reading your word and, and listening to the Holy Spirit. Help us to do that in the weeks and months to come. Amen.
down? Yeah, I, I don't think I, I did had one this week. Well, a husband and wife, so those two. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Nikki. Oh, yeah, that John Phillips is the best. <laughs> 